Today on the Hopefield Financial Podcast, I share a story about how I moved all my childhood toys to Utah and back. Today's budget tip is going to talk about how it's helpful to only spend money out of one place. We have a listener question that asks about the value of renting versus owning. And for the main topic, we're going to be going through an Investopedia article about managing money as newlyweds. Good morning and welcome to the Hopefield Financial Podcast. My name is Jay Desberger, your one and only Hopefield Financial Coach, and I am so happy that you're here with us today. To start, I want to tell you about how when I was getting ready to move out to Utah, I was dead set on taking all of my childhood toys with me. When I was in college, I lived in my parents' basement in order to save money. So in moving to Utah for my first job, this this was also the first time I moved out of my parents' house. I felt an essential obligation to, in moving out of my parents' house, move everything out. I didn't want to leave anything behind that they would be responsible for. In particular, I didn't want to leave my childhood toys behind. I know that I was a grown adult. I was getting ready to start my journey into the bigger world, and as the kids used to say, start adulting. But I didn't want to leave my toys behind. I just didn't want to have that as a burden or clutter that my parents had to deal with. I wanted to leave an empty room other than a bed and a dresser. Naturally, this would come at the expense of me needing to get a trailer that was large enough to take not only the possessions that were practical, but the ones that were more or less keepsakes from my childhood. And this added expense, this added space is something that might not align with frugality, but my intent was still there to get the stuff away from my parents and If I was moving away, I had nowhere else to take it unless I got a storage unit, and that wasn't in the cards for me. The condo in which I was moving to, space was limited. It had a number of closets, and I figured I could put the toys, just leave them in boxes and put them in the closet. I did want to save these things so that when I had a child down the road, I I could give him my childhood toys, and he could treasure them the way that I did when I was little. I had basically made up my mind on this goal. I was going to move all the toys to Utah, but my girlfriend didn't agree with this idea. She thought that it wasn't a frugal idea to move all the toys to Utah just because eventually I would move back closer to family in the future. So why move all the toys out to Utah if I'm just going to move them back? It would be cheaper to leave them with my parents and then after I move closer, relocate the toys then. Another great point that she had was the the storage space in the condo was going to be limited. And if I had the toys there, there might be something that I needed to have in the closets. There might be something else that was practical something that was useful for my adult life that I I wouldn't have room for just because I had the closet full of toys. These points were incredibly valid. Now, it comes down to the fact, though, that Amanda and I weren't married yet. We were simply dating. So because of that that point, she didn't get the final say. Uh, It was interesting making the final negotiations. She was was pretty sure that it was a bad idea to move the toys. And I said, I'm going to move the toys if there's room in the trailer. She didn't think there was going to be space to put them all, as I only had a small SUV and a small U-Haul trailer. But I managed to get everything in there and then have ample room to put the toys, to my surprise and hers. So the toys did get moved out to Utah. Oliver was born in Utah before we moved back to Kansas City. Now, we really probably would have gone about discussing the matter of moving the toys differently, had we been married at that point and not just dating. The nature of marriage means that both spouses get a vote. When you're dating, that's that's not necessarily the case when it comes to an individual's decisions and what they do with their stuff. I want you to keep this in mind as we move through the main topic later in the episode. But for now, it's time to cover today's budget tip. Today's budget tip echoes a sentiment that I've shared with you before on the Hope Filled Financial Podcast, and that is it's so much easier to budget if you're spending money from one place. For example, imagine you have a whole bunch of checking accounts and you're spending gas for one of them, and another one is for your wants, and another one is for your needs. In this example, let's say you have all the different checking accounts in order to physically separate your different pools of money. But as a trade-off for having physical separation for your pools of money, you're introducing complexity in reconciling your different accounts with your budget. If you have a whole bunch of different places where you're spending money from, 
and you need to update the budget, well, then you might need to go check each of the places you could spend from. And if the total number of your checking accounts and credit cards are somewhere near a dozen, well, checking a dozen places throughout the month, uh, four times a month or so, however often you update your budget, is a lot more exhausting than spending money from one source. Now, that's not to say that you only need to carry around just a single debit card as you're managing your money. If something were to happen to that debit card, if it were to be stolen or lost, well, you're out of luck when it comes to spending money out of your account. It is important to have some semblance of redundancy, but I don't advocate that that redundancy, a redundant checking account, be used for regular expenses. It lives there for the sake of if something happens to your normal spending account, something happens to your normal debit card, well, now you have something that you can fall back upon. This is a thing that I run into when I'm arguing about credit cards and whether or not credit cards are healthy or not. A common argument that is a pro for credit cards, well, if I have three credit cards and something were to happen to one of them, I can still spend from the other two. You can't do that if you just have a debit card tied to your one account. However, in marriage, you can have two debit cards tied to one account, and it's possible to have a second checking account that's tied to money that would get you through a period of an emergency, an identity theft emergency. If you want to learn more about cybersecurity, I highly recommend that you go back and listen to the episode where I interview Chalice and how her employer was compromised by the dark side ransomware, the same ransomware that took down the Colonial Pipeline. That interview covered very valuable information for all of you listening. I learned a great deal about protecting myself from identity theft, as well as shoring up my cybersecurity so that I could better take care of myself and my family. Now it's time to answer a question submitted by you. Today's question comes from Chris. Chris asks, I hate renting because I feel like I'm throwing money away. A friend of mine told me that I could buy a house with 3% down. Should I do that? That, Chris, is a great question. Renting can indeed feel like you're throwing money away, especially if mortgages in the area cost less than renting. That sort of circumstance is dependent not only on location, but the season that the real estate market is going through in that particular location. It's not something that is necessarily true. It's something that is sometimes true. But in the long run, I agree with you. Renting is not the long-term solution that you want to be looking for as you pursue your hope-filled financial future. The majority of millionaires, as recorded in studies that, that have been conducted by Ramsey Solution, have a good chunk of their millionaire net worth tied up in not only their 401k from their employer, but also a paid for home. Imagine owning your own home without having a mortgage on it. You no longer have the largest chunk of your paycheck coming out and going to your housing expense every month, and you can apply your greatest wealth building asset, your income, to other facets of your financial future, other goals that you have in front of you outlined in your budget. So our long-term goal should really be to own a house outright. That doesn't mean renting doesn't have a place at all. There are certain seasons in life where either you can't get a mortgage or your housing situation is temporary. And if you are going to be in a place for, say, five years or less, for example, imagine you're planning on getting married or having children in the near future, and those life changes would necessitate a change in dwelling, potentially. Historically speaking, if you are planning on moving in the next five years or less, if, if you have a move in the near future, closing costs and then costs for when you sell the home are probably going to outweigh any gain that you're going to have if you own a home for that short duration. That's not always the case, and the crazy real estate market that we've had has definitely proven to be an exception to that. But in general, short-term situations are better for renting versus owning. You have a lot more flexibility on getting out of a house in short order if you're renting as opposed to needing to sell. And if the real estate market is slow or even down, you might be looking at a loss or having to wait a good deal of time before you can tap into the equity of your home that you list for sale. So renting has its place and it's not throwing money away. You are paying rent for the conveniences that come with renting and the flexibility for short-term home situations. But again, you want to be focusing on having a paid-for home for the long term, especially by the time you hit retirement. The average millionaire will pay off their home in about 11 years of getting a mortgage. Now, your question specifies you can get a home by putting 3% down. Now, that is the bare minimum down payment that you could be putting out there. And you need to know about something when you're putting a down payment on a house. And that is if your down payment, the equity that you'd have in the house after the purchase is less than 20% of the home's value, well, you're going to run into something called PMI, private mortgage insurance. 
Private mortgage insurance is a insurance premium that you are paying in order to pay for insurance for the mortgage company, for the lender who's giving you the money. If you don't make your payments, that insurance is supposed to help your lender recoup their loss. And they don't pay for that premium on their own. If you have less than a 20% down payment, they consider you to be a higher risk client in mandate. It is mandated that you pay the insurance premium. And that can add a couple hundred dollars a month to your mortgage bill, depending on how big your mortgage is. And we don't want to deal with private mortgage insurance if we can avoid it. So if you have the ability to save up to a 20% down payment in short order before you need to be seeking a permanent home situation, or you can save up to at least 10% of a down payment and know that you can get your equity up to 20% in short order, say the real estate values are climbing radically and you're in an area projected to continue growing, well, you could get into a home, pay private mortgage insurance for a little bit, and refinance once you hit that 20% equity due to the growth in the market. That is taking on a risk, though. The only reason I would personally ever go and purchase a home with as little as 3% down would be if I was expecting to stay in that home for at least seven years, five to seven years. That way I could start putting some good equity into it. And I go in with the idea that I'm going to be throwing extra money at the mortgage. I would want to make sure that the home that I'm buying results in a payment that is less than the maximum recommended. If your monthly mortgage payment is less than 35% of your take-home pay, well, you have the ability to pour in more money and build up equity faster. And if you have a plan where you can get past PMI faster after buying the house with very little down, you know you're going to stay in it, and the equity that you acquire in that time is going to outweigh the loss that you might incur if you're renting and quote-unquote throwing money away and saving up for that down payment. So there, there are a lot of facets to consider. I would talk to a professional real estate agent who can help you run the numbers on that, and who, someone who knows the real estate market, knows what might be happening in the future. They can guide you with that. And if you're concerned about buying a home with 3% down, all the factors, the pros, the cons, the trade-offs that are involved with that, and you're looking for someone to help you understand a comprehensive financial picture when you make that home purchase, well, that's what I do as a financial coach. You can go to the website, sign up for a free consultation, and I'm here to help you. I hope that answers your question, Chris. Thank you so much for submitting it. If you have a question that you want to be answered on the podcast, please leave it in the comments below or send us a message through the little form on the bottom page of our website, hopefilledfinancial.com, and we'll make sure that your question becomes a part of the podcast. Now it's time to move on to today's main topic. For today's main topic, as mentioned before, we're going to go through the Investopedia article. It's right here. Managing money as a newly married couple. Pros and cons of three ways to run your finances now that you are family. I want to let you know that I am not sponsored by Investopedia. I simply saw the title for this article and thought it would be fun to react to it with you here today. Let's dive into the meat of the article here. How will you manage money as a newly married couple? One practicality you need to discuss, preferably before saying I do, is what your money style will be going forward. I totally agree with that. While it's true, in general, getting married makes financial sense, how do you make it make sense? And sense for you. Haha, uh-huh, clever pun. There are three main ways that couples manage their finances separately, jointly, or with a combination of separate and joint accounts. Here are a few tips to help you figure out which strategies will work best for you both, along with the pros and the cons of each system. I want to add here as a financial coach who's a huge advocate for marriage, I believe that the absolute healthiest way with a rare exception to manage money in marriage is with joint accounts. They probably cover why I have that opinion in the article, so we're going to keep going and see, and if they don't, I'll add my two cents. Let's continue with the key takeaways from the article. Honesty about money is essential for trust in marriage. Agreed. Couples can manage their money with separate accounts, a joint account, or some combination of the two. All are possible. Separate accounts help avoid arguments, but take more planning and may lose out on the best way to manage your family money. Interesting. 
A joint account makes budgeting simplest, agreed, but can lead to more conflicts if partner spending habits don't mesh. Combining a joint account with a private checking account for each spouse lets you track expenses and creates fewer money conflicts. Money can be one of the most difficult topics for couples, but no matter how uncomfortable it feels, the two most important words to remember about marriage and money are never lie. Just as honesty is crucial to any relationship's success, honesty is essential in discussion about money. Lying about finances to a spouse damages trust and can ultimately lead to divorce court. Don't be tempted. And that's my biggest problem with the separate accounts. It does take more effort to communicate about everything. And even though you may not intend to lie if you're running separate accounts, it can come across that way if you're not telling the full story or you're not being very forward and transparent with how you're managing your money, how you're spending it, how you're giving it, and what you intend to do with it. By having separate accounts, you have to have a very vivid plan on how you're going to be communicating your financial intentions with each other. Lest a simple omission of information be interpreted, be it true or false, as a lie. The other thing that I have a problem with with the separate accounts is it allows you the freedom to engage in financial behavior that may be disapproved of by your spouse. The number one indicator that a marriage is on the rocks and tending toward failure is one spouse simply thinking that the other spends money foolishly. If you have a joint account and you have to make your spending decisions on paper on purpose with a budget before the spending happens, there's no room left for judgment if you stick to the budget. So it simply removes the possibility when exercised well, it removes the possibility that you think your spouse's spending habits are a violation of what you see to be properly frugal. Managing money as a newly married couple with separate accounts. Keeping separate accounts may be a comfortable starting point for many couples, especially when they are accustomed to managing their own finances and don't yet have many shared expenses. When couples move in together, there will likely be at least some income difference, not to mention debts that are brought into the relationship. A separate accounting system can help clarify income disparities, debts, and potential spender versus saver personality conflicts. Despite the autonomy, separate accounts actually mean more communication about who will be responsible for paying what. Some couples decide to split expenses down the middle, while others may be more comfortable paying proportionally according to what they earn. A shared spreadsheet may be the easiest way to track expenditures, or using a joint credit card may be preferable. You will still have to budget for household expenditures and discuss long-term savings and retirement goals. Still, separate accounts provide you with more freedom to manage your money with autonomy. Before I comment on this, let's go over their pros and cons. Pros, you are each responsible for your own spending habits and paying off any debts you brought into the marriage, provided you are both happy with how you've agreed to split the shared bills. This money management method is most fair, and you may be less likely to argue over your spouse's spending habits. Cons. Keeping track of who owes whom what is a lot of work each month. This financial management method gets more difficult if children enter into the mix, or if one of you wants to change careers or go back to school. If you are both saving for retirement or goals based on your own incomes, you may not be optimizing your investments. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. If you're married, you just get married, one spouse has a ton of debt, like a big student loan debt, and the other one has been saving and investing and has a, a, a pretty decent amount of money that's just sitting there in a pool. And that pool of money is greater than the other spouse's debt that they have on student loans. Let's assume that these spouses are both working, and the working spouse with the student loan debt is not making as much as the other. Is it going to be optimal or fair to tell the spouse who brought in the student loan debt, hey, you need to pay this off. I know that you don't make as much as me, and I know that collectively, if you look at our picture together, we have enough money to cut a check and pay it now. But, you know, that was my money before we got married, so you need to work extra hard and get rid of that debt. No, I don't think that's the best way to go because you're married. All of everything that you have on this earth now belongs to each other. That's the way that the law is structured. If something were to happen, 
to one spouse, the other one would inherit the other's net worth, anything that belonged to them. Goodness, the way we file taxes can be jointly as if everything were combined. And if one spouse decides to stay home with the children and the other one earns the money, managing money separately then makes even less sense because the person who's staying at home is providing a great deal of value by removing the expense of child care. So what is that spouse who's staying home supposed to do if the primary breadwinner wants to continue maintaining everything separately and they believe that they have to pay for the bills, but the other one doesn't get any say then in the savings goals and the like? That doesn't make any sense. A marriage is a partnership where both spouses get equal say, regardless of pay, when it comes to their futures. To do anything shy of giving each spouse an equal vote is to tell one spouse that they are lesser than the other just because of the income they make. And income, money, is not a scorecard for spouses to compare each other and provide a source of division. Money should be something that simply promotes healthy communication and planning that helps you grow your goals together so that you can live a mutually beneficial, mutually agreed upon future hope-filled financial future that is beautiful. Let's jump back into the article. This part is a little shorter. With a joint account, in terms of simplifying your management style as a couple, this choice is probably the easiest, though there are some fine points to consider. No one needs to determine relative income payment levels. You don't have to update a spreadsheet each month, and all children's expenses get paid out of the family account. Budgets can be easily tracked on a spreadsheet or on budgeting software that is available online or with smartphone apps, and the simplicity will make tracking spending easy. Oddly enough, that sounds an awful lot like our budget tip today. You need to be spending out of as few locations as possible in order to maintain a simple way of spending money that is easy to track and easy to apply to budgeting. It reduces your friction from exercising the healthy habit of frugal budgeting. Let's talk about the pros in the article. Pros. It's easier to track budgeting and spending. Ding, ding. Plus, there is no monthly division of resources. Ding, ding. And no financial changes are needed as the family grows. Wonderful. Cons. Judging your partner's spending habits can lead to resentment, especially if one partner earns more than the other. It also may be hard to keep surprise gifts a secret. All right, the surprise gift thing, yeah, that that is uh, that's something that you run into for sure. But there are ways around it, and Amanda and I have. I should probably put that as a budget tip in the future. So they say that judging your partner's spending habits is like the big con here for having a joint account. But to the contrary, if you are making a plan together and you are agreeing on that plan, you're actually running a budget then you don't get to judge your spouse's spending habits. They're transparently presented in advance in the budget. And, you know, you could have some fun money, and you can say you can spend this fun money on whatever you want. We know that our plans and our goals and our priorities are accounted for before that fun money is spent. So you can go spend it on whatever you want, and you agree there is no shame, no blame, no judgment for spending that money on whatever it is that the spouse discretionarily wants to engage with, unless, of course, that spending is something that is relatively immoral, but that's a different problem altogether. But a joint account allows a transparency and a clarity that removes the judgment that can be there when you run a budget. If there's no budget involved and you're managing things together, yeah, you you could open up a great deal of room for judging each other, but that also exists when you manage money separately too. It entirely exists there. You simply are able to fabricate in your mind, since you're not necessarily running your spouse's numbers, if you keep it that separate, you can be seeing the things that they bring home each day and go, you know what? They're spending way too much on video games, or they're spending way too much on this particular hobby, Or why are they spending so much on food and eating out? You know, I would never spend that kind of money on that. The way that you can inflate that judgment in your head with separate accounts is overblown by separating the accounts. It takes the judgment and sweeps it under the rug so you don't have to discuss it. And if you don't have to discuss it, it allows the dirt that's under the rug to grow and grow and grow until it pops and you have a major problem. Again, the number one indicator that a marriage is going to fail is judging the other for their spending habits. I think a joint account with a budget is the way around that to alleviate the greatest threat to your marriage happiness. 
With that, let's move on to the last section of the article, with both separate and joint accounts. Having both separate and joint accounts can be complicated, but it also may be the best solution for some couples. This method's idea is that all income goes into a joint account or accounts, and all savings, debt, and retirement are managed jointly. Besides, each individual has a private checking account into which a set amount is transferred each month. Effectively, this is a way of having some semblance of fund money that's assigned to each spouse, but giving each spouse a debit card, an account that they can spend out of without the other one necessarily seeing those expenses. This personal fund can be spent on wants or needs they have that aren't a joint expense or on gifts for their spouse. This way, your spouse can never judge you for buying $400 shoes or top-of-the-line headphones as long as you pay for them out of your own account. The amount that goes into the personal accounts each month needs to be discussed and agreed upon to avoid conflict. This takes the idea of, okay, here's the fund money that you can spend in the budget, and it comes out of your joint account, and simply extends that to separating accounts with the perceived goal of avoiding judgment. But as I mentioned before, avoiding judgment isn't what you're doing when you're separating accounts. You're creating a lack of clarity for what the money is being spent on and allowing an inflated or skewed perspective from the spouse to possibly grow and basically make out a straw man that represents unhealthy spending that may or may not actually be happening. I, I think removing transparency removes a level of trust. By dropping the boundaries of having se separate accounts, you're dropping the ego boundaries that could separate you in marriage where you should be unified on the most intimate and emotional level. And arguably, combining money is one of the most intimate ways that you can unify your marriage. Now, it mentioned here again gifts and how it's harder to give a surprise gift when you're married and you have everything joint. So I should probably go back to that. I don't think I hit it before. Um, one thing that you can do is you go and you buy a gift card with the amount that you have on the budget. And you say, okay, this is the amount that I have to spend for XYZ gift from, for my spouse, for their birthday, for Christmas, for our anniversary. And you give them that little pre-charged gift card that they can spend almost anywhere. That's one way around it. Another one is you allocate the amount that you're allowed to spend on the gift for the other in the budget and know that you need to spend from a place that's not going to in the checking account say, hey, you spent money from here and list out what it is that you bought. Like you could go to an online store that you both don't go to or don't have a joint account on for, say, Amazon. You don't necessarily have to have the same Amazon account. You could buy it from an Amazon account that your spouse doesn't have. It says Amazon purchase, but you don't know what it is that they got you in particular. Another thing that I did recently for Mother's Day is Amanda wanted lilacs. And we knew that we were going to basically be buying lilacs for Mother's Day. That was somewhat a joint decision. But I still wanted to have a surprise. So what I did, my sister works at a nursery. And I told her to pick up the lilacs and have them for when we were visiting my parents just before Mother's Day. And I would be able to surprise her with the lilacs and then pay my family back for the flowers at that point. In that case, a an expense didn't even pop up as we're updating the budget and managing the money there. And it wasn't anything that I had to hide in that respect, but I was still able to surprise her with a gift. And, you know, the idea of surprised gifts, I say hide. I think surprise gifts are the only context where it's okay to be keeping a secret in marriage like that. And it's agreed upon that you're doing it for the sake of a fun surprise. Let's jump into the pros and the cons here that they have. Pros, you have the ease of tracking that you get with joint accounts and you don't have to deal with income disparities while paying the bills. You each have the freedom to buy what you want without discussing it with your significant other, but you also work together toward joint goals and retirement. Again, if you in your budget and you're 100% joint, you have a particular amount of fund money that's allocated to each spouse that they can spend without consulting the other, 
you can have the exact same freedom while maintaining the total transparency that joint accounts have. Cons. This method is simple to track, but it requires opening and managing several bank accounts. Having an amount deposited into your personal account each month may feel like an allowance, which might rub some people the wrong way. Yeah, that that could definitely come across as weird, especially if you only have a separate account for the spouse who's not running the books all the time, the free spirit, and they feel like they're getting an allowance, but the nerd keeps the free money for themselves in the joint account because they're like, oh, you know, I don't need to hide anything from them because they're not checking the checking account every day. Well, that could definitely feel like you're getting an allowance and stepping away from tracking your fund money or your fund spending money could lead you to a point where you inflate what you're giving each other for individual discretionary monies to a point where it almost defeats the idea of having a joint account altogether. You end up going beyond what your fund money would be if you were in a joint account only. And that might sound like a benefit to you. Woo, I get to spend more money. But it could be taking away from some of your other major goals if you're not watching every dollar. And you can only do that simply if you're spending out of one place together. The article does have one more bit here called additional tips for all couples. Regardless of how you decide to manage your money, you must also consider many things when planning your lives together. Every household has to decide who pays for what. Unlike your past experiences with roommates, however, you probably won't want to keep pantry items separate in your marriage. You also have a vested interest in paying bills on time to preserve your credit. Important, a spouse isn't just a roommate. You need to figure logistics and plan as a family for shared goals and an excellent credit rating. While they're putting more emphasis on a credit score than I probably would, it's true. You don't want to treat your marriage like you have a roommate or a joint venture. Combining finances is a great way to separate the relationship that you would have with a roommate as opposed to one that you have in marriage. By com- You don't combine finances with a roommate. That's just not done. Well, it's not the most romantic part of moving in together. Newlyweds need to talk about household logistics, who pays which bills, how you will reimburse each other, and how you will work towards shared goals. Plan to sit down and discuss these logistics to ensure you both understand and agree on the plan and that all your bases are covered. That's the other thing that's kind of hinted at there. If you have separate accounts, and you, you have to almost be paying each other back or reimbursing each other or talking about who pays what, almost like you are roommates or almost like you're a joint business adventure. And it just becomes very technical in a way that doesn't emphasize the beauty of marriage. Once it's decided who pays which bills, automate the payments so you're never late and your spouse never has to worry and continues to discuss finances regularly in Money Matters, clarity is paramount. Clarity is paramount. Newlyweds should also discuss retirement and long-term goals, such as buying a house or taking a dream vacation. If as a couple, and you can't afford to, it's a good idea for both spouses to be contributing to retirement accounts and set up an automated system to facilitate saving for those long-range goals now. Bottom line, there is no right way to manage your finances as a new couple, But with communication, trust, and a bit of planning, you and your spouse can have a marriage that's free of conflict about money. If you're struggling to come up with a joint plan that sits well with both of you, seek professional advice from a financial counselor or a financial coach. The thing that I want to leave here is the the discussion they have about trust and how there's no right way to manage money, particularly in marriage. To the contrary, they, they highlight it. Clarity is key. Honesty, transparency, and completeness of clarity is key in marriage. It leaves no room for misinterpreting your spouse or holding court in your head when you're thinking about what they might be doing with money that you can't see. And you need to be thinking about why you would be motivated to have separate accounts beyond the reasons here. What is the deep core reason why you wouldn't want your spouse to know what you spend money on? Is it because you think they would genuinely judge you negatively for it? If so, having separate accounts is not only going to perpetuate that fear that they're going to judge you for what you spend on, 
but it's also going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy by allowing you to engage with behavior that isn't approved of by your spouse for some reason. To the contrary, if you have joint accounts and you have a desire or a will or a goal that isn't aligned with your spouse's values, well, you get to talk about it and they get to basically play devil's advocate and make sure that you have thought through the decision. I've mentioned the TV story before on the podcast, but the, the short version of it, I wanted a nice TV. Amanda didn't care about TV. I said I wanted to spend five grand on a TV. She thought 500 was a lot for a TV. When we meet in the middle and we say, okay, we'll spend somewhere less than $2,000 and we will save up for it for X number of years before we buy it so that you feel comfortable with other things. Well, there's no room for judgment for me wanting a TV, even when it's purchased. If I did the, the separate accounts or even the, the hybrid method discussed in the article, well, it's possible I could save up for that TV and I could buy it in either less time or more time or the same amount of time. But she could still judge me for the TV that I purchased because we didn't talk about it. We didn't discuss why I picked that one, why I spent that much as opposed to more or less. There isn't going to be mutual communication and mutual decisions on those big fun purchases that could lead to heavy judgment. And as they said, having separate accounts makes it harder to plan for the future. You have to have a lot more time and attention that creates friction between you and having a healthy, well-communicated plan, while a joint account simply brings harmony and naturally encourages that plan to where you can't deny having a plan together. You have to engage in having a plan together. Next week, I'm going to start the podcast with a fun story, a physics metaphor that I used to use in college. I used the metaphor as a joke to poke fun at myself, but now, as a financial coach, I use the same physics joke to explain how managing money and marriage in a particular way can help lead your hearts to grow together. You don't want to miss next week's episode. Subscribe if you don't want to miss it on Tuesday. And until then, budget bravely and enjoy your hope-filled financial future. Mm-hmm.